uh, is a is a eugenics at UVA, and what Dr. Reynolds does so well and so beautifully is really not just look back at history, but connect the dots to today. So, what's the legacy of eugenics? What are we dealing with today in the healthcare system that is the echoes of this? The only way to describe it, it was, it was like a cult. It was a cult of science. And, you know, I'm not going to say the early 20th century because, as you're going to learn, it lasted well into the 20th century. Oh, uh, here. The what? Still here in many ways. In some ways, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that. This is, um, to, we're here tonight because City Space was booked. And so to be here tonight to talk about something like this, personally, um, I have to tell you, it, it, it's really important to me uh, because I stood in this very room um, right here over 20 years ago, and I was the first person that stood up and said to City Council, we need some kind of a monument to talk about what happened at Vinegar Hill. We need to be talking about that as a community. I was working on a book at the time. I had spent you know, years sitting in people's kitchens and living rooms and dining rooms with people who were crying, white and white, telling me about Vinegar Hill, like it was yesterday. And I said, what is this Vinegar Hill? <laughs> so I started learning about it. This is like, you know, 94, 95. And I went before city council and said, this is an important story. And this is what good historians do. It's what good communities do. You embrace the complications of your past. Don't ignore them. Don't hide them. You embrace the complications, because it's a human story. Um, and, and nothing is ever so cut and dry. It's not all black and white. It's hard to the pun. But there's nuance, there's complexity, and, and good historians look for that complexity. I stood here over 20 years ago and suggested a monument to Vinegar Hill that we need to tell that story. And I got laughed at in this room by city council, who were all Democrats, and they just didn't get it. Like, why would we do that? Why would we dredge up all that horrible stuff from ancient history? And I told them that night, said, this is an ancient history of so many people who live here. And we need to embrace those stories that still touch people's lives. And this is one of them. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this story, about eugenics, not just at UVA, but in this community, in our healthcare system today. Um, you're going to be hearing a lot more of that in the coming years. And I'm thankful for that. It's, it's, it's a difficult conversation. But we need, to, we desperately need to have that conversation. Again, it's one of those things that's just over to And so I applaud you for being here to be a part of that and to help take this, what you learned here tonight, out into the community and share it with the people you love, the people you work with, the people you know. It's a really important story. And there's no one better to tell this story than Dr. Preston Reynolds, who is a, not only a physician, um, but a medical historian. And she has, uh, I don't want to take up any more of her time. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Preston Reynolds. <laughs>
health disparities and the contribution of our health professionals to really been meeting the needs of the people for the last 150 years. Um, I was on the President's Commission on Slavery in the University on the Local Advisory Committee. And since I was a medical historian, I was teaching this course. They asked me to give a lecture as part of their semester course on slavery and its impact in the university, and they assigned me the topic of eugenics. I said, oh, please. you know, I give a little couple lectures on race science. I can easily talk about eugenics. Well, I discovered, much to my um, amazement, this book, and I would encourage any of you that are interested in this topic to pick up a copy. It is really brilliant. And the whole focus of this book is eugenics at UVA. It is really a brilliant piece of scholarship. Um, unfortunately, Gregory Moore is not here. Um, Paul Lombardo is professor and mentor on faculty at UVA. And Paul spent his academic work looking at eugenics, really the history of sterilization. So you're, if you're interested in that topic, I would strongly encourage you to pick up these books. And the reason why I do this as a good scholar, I can tell you what my original research is, and I can also tell you that I'm telling you the stories that other people have written about in those scholars. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, I've put together in a chapter in this book. Um, so if you want the footnotes, it's there. <laughs> and that as a good historian um, preparing for this lecture, that I was to give these undergraduate students, um, I started doing my historical research and reading more broadly on this topic. And this is eugenics in the Deep South. The Deep South approached this very differently than Virginia. And a really good friend of mine, Ken Ludmer, who is a brilliant medical historian, in his master's thesis was how eugenics impacted the field of genetics. And one would not be surprised, but the field of genetics was very slow to develop because of the taint of eugenics. Um, this was his master's thesis in Hopkins. He has gone on to be writing some really, really pivotal medical historical work. So I come to this topic, um, and I will have to say that it really now has fundamentally shaped and enriched my understanding of race discrimination. Um, from my historical work in race discrimination in healthcare and my law and policy, I then was recruited into the whole field of health disparities as it emerged in the 1990s. And it now is a nationally recognized, internationally promoted field of scholarship now focusing on health equity. Um, it was an idea people had in the early 1990s. Well, there were maybe 20 papers published in 1999. There are now thousands and thousands published every year in the NIH Institute devoted just to health experience. So what I'm going to try to do today is weave these different threads together. So it's not just on eugenics, but try to look at the broader impact of an idea. Fields as a graduate student in the history. I would argue that the idea of eugenics had huge impact that really shaped what we now call health disparities by impacting the social determinants of health. And we'll talk about <coughs> the role in constructing that narrative in Virginia. So, First of all, what are eugenics? What is eugenics? And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what race science and eugenics look like at UVA. We'll talk about the impact of that. And we'll just end with a conversation about what restorative justice might look like. So health disparities, and I'll start off the narrative framing it, that it's the difference between a majority, and often we that reference group is white men, and minority, and whether you define minority by race, by ethnicity, by literacy, by disability, by gender preference, 
by geographic location, by socioeconomic status, you know, all of those variables will diminish the longevity and burden those individuals with more disease and more disease burden. So that they have a shorter life expectancy, higher maternal mortality, and worse health outcomes in actually every disease category that scientists have looked at. And I often say, even when it comes to amputation of legs and diabetics, minorities have more amputations rather than surgery preserving um, initiatives. So what's the cost of health disparities? It's huge. And many people will argue that attention to health disparities should be the number one priority in medicine in this country. It's not. But this is just from 2006. You can see a snapshot of what the cost of unattention to health disparities is to this country. What are the causes? Scientists look at many causes and contributors to health disparities today. And we'll go through some of these. Um, and there's a rich literature on all of them. But in terms of historically, I would ask you, what are the historic origins of health disparities that we see today? And I would argue historical origins rest in the slave trade, the oppression of one group by another, and the normalization of that oppression. George Fredrickson was really a famous historian, American historian, of racism in America. Um, um, nominated Pulitzer Prize writer. Um, and he wrote a short synopsis of racism, published in 2002, that really became a classic in the field. And he argues that racism is when differences that might otherwise be considered ethnocultural are regarded as innate indelible and unchangeable, that a racist attitude or ideology can be said to exist. So, racism is the belief that differences are fixed. So with that backdrop, I'd like to now get into what is eugenics. And eugenics was the idea that we can improve the stock of humans through breeding. Just like we breed cows and breed dogs and breed animals and breed plants, we can do that with human beings and with selective breeding we can improve and advance and speed up natural evolution. In America, those advocates of eugenics believed that there were two prototypic stock one from Plymouth and the other one from Jamestown. And these were the original colonialists. And these individuals possess some extra added genetic trait that gave them the strength to leave their motherland and come to a new country to seek freedom and what became the democratic experiment. And they possess something genetically, biologically, intellectually, emotionally that enabled them to survive really harsh conditions and unfavorable living environments. So, eugenics, as I said, was a study of how human traits were inherited. And they used genealogy, they used comparative anatomy, they used intelligence tests. So there was a tradition in medical practice in the 18th 19th, 17th century, where physicians used the power of observation, power of measurement, because really that's all we had at the time, to catalog the differences like the arms, capacity of lungs, head size, prowess, whatever. And there's a whole literature that was published that compares physical differences between white people and black people. And that's what we call the foundations of race science. 
Um, and if you're interested, I can give you references. But the goal of eugenics was actually to use this information to actually enable the fit to marry and procreate and to restrict what were perceived as the unfit in order to eliminate mental illness, mental slowness, illness, physical disabilities, so that society would not bear the costs of taking care of them and we would not bear the costs of treating those illnesses when they arose. There were two major forms of eugenics, one positive, practiced in England, um, where they incentivized the wealthy and the elite and the socially affluent to marry and have kids. Negative eugenics practiced in America was restrictive. And it was punitive. And it was oppressive. Nothing happens on its own, things happen in a context, and all, all historians will tell you that. And what's the context for eugenics? Well, it rises after the end of the Civil War, after Reconstruction and the Redemptive Era, in the middle of the Progressive Era. Um, we have the rise of natural experimental science, so that's happening in the late 19th century. We have Pasteur, who discovers the bacteria that causes syphilis. We have Verkau, who is the father of pathology and virology. So we have these scientists in Europe making these major discoveries. We get the development of the experimental method, which is, I suspect this organism causes this illness. So I will give this organism to this mouse see if this mouse gets this infection, and that enables me to develop theories of causative agents. So this is the rise of bacteriology, the rise of infectious disease caused by specific agents. This is all happening in the late 18th, 19th, early 20th century. It's important to understand, though, that we do not have the rise of therapeutic interventions. So there's no antibiotics, there's no IV fluids, there's nothing that we think of in terms of modern medicine. We have a stethoscope, we have the creation of a microscope, we have the development of bacterial cultures, but medical therapeutics is extremely primitive. There's also this idea of asepsis, which is a new idea in the 19th century, which is if we sterilize things, then we will prevent infection from being passed from one person to another. So a major innovation in the Civil War and after the Civil War was to actually clean knives between amputation from one person to another, and then you would pass that infection infected gangrene material from one limb to another. Semmelweis, who was an obstetrician, believed that one of the causes of purple fever or, or streptococcal infection in women at birth was that men didn't wash their hands between one birth and another, and they passed that infected material from one vaginal canal to another. Okay. The whole medical community thought he was crazy, and he was so ostracized that he ended up committing suicide. So I want you to understand that the ideas that are happening in the late 19th century, around the turn of the century in 1900, are really revolutionizing the way medical people are thinking. And so there's one thought that's coming up in the medicine called bacteriology, infectious disease, this is cause of these. The other thought is eugenics that in fact diseases are inherited and the tendency toward disease is inherited. Okay, so eugenics is also occurring after Reconstruction ends, after the Redemptive Era ends, and we have a social order that is fluid with those in power wanting to maintain a power structure that leaves white men on top, 
blacks, women, and the poor on the body. And so eugenics is an idea that reinforces that class structure, that racial structure, that gender structure. The third idea is that science could solve the ills of society. And this, as science is becoming the powerful ideology, people are saying, well, maybe the answer to social problems can be found in the laws of nature. So there emerged this idea called the eugenics metaphor. And eugenics was a popular idea. It was not confined to the medical community. It was in Ladies Home Journal. It was in Good Housekeeping. It was in Life, if those magazines existed back then. No. But they had, at 4-H clubs, at state county fairs, they had eugenic contests to see the finished child. So this idea of eugenics was actually embraced <coughs> by the wider public. And therefore, those physicians advocated for eugenic science were seen as those who would help advance the social order. So if society was analogous to a living organism, the body politic, then the answers to societal problems could be found in the laws of nature. And thus, the laws of nature, or the laws of inheritance, were also rediscovered in the late 19th century, around the turn of the century. So these laws I learned as a medical student. You have autosomal dominant, you have autosomal recessive. In fact, today, there are genes that transmit in an autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive fashion. This is still valid. But most of the traits that we appreciate are very complex, and they do not migrate as autosomal dominant or recessive traits. But we've learned that in part through the Human Genome Project and through population genetics and other scientific work in the last 50 years. Okay. So with that backed up, I now want to go to UVA. Um, and this is uh, a history, as Koi has said, that the university is embracing. And it wants this story to be known. And what we're trying to figure out is how do we do that restorative justice with this history? So I use this slide to begin to appreciate, we'll go through most of these people, but for you to appreciate that the leadership of this institution beginning in 1850 through the 1960s were major, major nationally prominent eugenicists. And they create a culture that really reflects the racism of eugenic ideology. But like all good UVA faculty, I have to say that things start with Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> um, as, as a historian, I have to say, what is race science? And we talked about race science. Race science is simply the documentation of differences between groups of individuals categorized as white, black, Chinese, Native American, whatever category you are using, it's cataloging those differences. And for race science, it's pretty much a difference between white and blacks. And historians do look to Thomas Jefferson as the founder of race science. It's important to understand that the reason this is significant is because there probably was no person more widely read than Thomas Jefferson. Not only politically, but also his work in biology and natural science. And he, like a good Enlightenment scientist, used the power of observation. Because that's all we had. We didn't have the experimental method then. And so he cataloged what he saw among the slaves at Monticello. And nothing he wrote was nice. He didn't write about Sally Hemings' siblings and children who were master chefs 
he didn't write about the accomplishments of the other slaves in terms of craftsmen and building and architecture. What he wrote about was very derogatory. And this came down as truth. Because it was Thomas Jefferson's writing, and because of the power of observation, which was really what the only tool they had at the time. As I've gotten to understand um, through the President's Commission, um, Monticello, Montpelier, U.S. Constitution, Declaration of Independence, I have come to appreciate um, how nervous the founders were that this experiment of democracy was not going to survive. In fact, in eight places in the Constitution, slavery is constitutionally justified because economically, I think they did not think this country, this experiment, could risk the freeing of the slaves because of the economic need for that free labor. But it's also important to recognize that he really believed that any attempt to assimilate blacks with the American polity is a greater threat to the integrity of the republic than naturalizing immigrants. His three-fifths of a person was really intellectually, physically, morally, personally, he did not think those individuals were capable of full citizenship. Um, but he also wrote that the opinion that they are inferior in faculties of reason and imagination must be hazarded with great diffidence. To justify a general conclusion requires many observations, even where the subject may be submitted to the anatomical knife, to optical glasses, and to analysis by fire or by solvents. So when you look at medical education, and you look at the dissection of individuals, you're looking at those individuals testing this hypothesis and continuing to do those anatomical comparisons and the other kinds of studies that would test his hypothesis or refute his hypothesis. So now I'm going to go through some of the UVA faculty. Um, and the first one I'm going to start with is James Lawrence Cobble. We have Cobble Hall. It actually was not named for him. It was named for a relative of his. <laughs> but he was a towering figure at UVA. Um, he came from a large slave-holding family very well established. He, in 1933, completed UVA with the highest degree possible in the United States, which was a master's degree. He then, with the support of his father, went to Europe and toured the major centers of clinical and research, merging scientific study and clinical studies. And all of the great physicians in the 19th century went to Europe for a year or two or three, because there really was no clinical training available in this country at that time. And the emergence of clinical medicine with neurology, psychiatry, the use of the stethoscope, it was all happening in Europe. So if you wanted to be a great doctor, that's where you had to go to get trained under the emerging leading clinicians at the time. He came back in 19, 1837 and became the third professor of medicine and surgery. Uh, he rose to be president, the equivalent of president of UVA in 1946. And he retires in 1989. So I want you, uh, 1889, so I want you to appreciate that he's on the faculty for 52 years. Um, so this person has a towering presence. He is a slaveholder. He comes from a slaveholder family, and he has slaves while he's on faculty at UVA. At the same time, he's a major innovator. He adopts the idea of a sepsis. He believes in public health as a way to improve the health of the community. He runs the Civil War Hospital in Charlottesville. He adopts this idea of sterilizing knives. So on the one hand, he is absolutely leading his profession in new ideas. 
He also becomes an original founder of the American Public Health Association and becomes president of that organization its second year in existence. So he sets out in the good Jeffersonian tradition to examine this question, the origins of man. And there are two theories going on at the time. One is polygenism, which was we are all descendants from lots of different people. Or, biblically, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. Well, most slaveholders were Christians. And they believed that people were descendants of Adam and Eve. But if you believed that we're descendants of Adam and Eve, then the oppression of God's chosen was immoral. So he needed to figure out how can he justify slavery at the same time hold himself up as a God-fearing slaveholder. Okay. So he comes up with this idea after an exhaustive review of the existing scholarship, which he synthesizes in this book. And he argues that we are descendants of Adam and Eve, but over time, and based on different geographic locations, people create different evolutionary tracks, and those become permanent varieties that then get transmitted generations down. And so we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, and we're all entitled to God's grace, that does not mean that by the 10th generation we're all equal. And in fact, some individuals, those from Europe, <coughs> evolve at a higher and better level than those descendants that are in Africa. Okay, so he comes up with this idea of a single creation with permanent varieties arising from a common ancestor. Contact with whites, as he writes, contact with whites under the benign institution of slavery may have been intended by the merciful and wise providence of God as the only means of extricating blacks from their otherwise inevitable <coughs> destiny, which basically was to live as savages on the continent of Africa. And the importance of noting what he's writing is that he is the most prominent person at UVA. He is teaching medical students, he is influencing the faculty, um, and he is serving in a leadership role within the public health community. What emerges within the public health community is two threats. One, that we can improve population through eugenics, and the other threat, demonstrated by Walter Reed, is that we can improve the environment as a way to improve the health of the population. So Kabul is succeeded by uh, Paul Brandon Beringer. Um, and Beringer um, also has roots to colonial Virginia. He comes from a large slave-owning family. His grandfather was Brigadier General in the War of 1812. His father commanded cavalry in the Civil War. He personally met Jefferson Davis as a child and had a lifelong belief that blacks were biologically, intellectually inferior. In fact, at age 70, he said, the worst day of my life was emancipation and all the slaves walked off our plantation and I realized the only thing that kept them was a whip and a chain. He trained under Kabul. He was sick as a student. Kabul took care of him and he became a lifelong devotee. He went uh, to UVA Medical School, graduated in 1877, and went, took a second medical degree at NYU. It's important to understand that at that time, medical degrees were only two years. He basically sat in a classroom for about four months, five months in the winter, had the same set of lectures recited to you by faculty in black robes standing behind the podium. And if you got any clinical training, you would apprentice yourself to someone and find out how to do some clinical maneuvers. Anyways, he interned at Bellevue in New York, and then, like Cobble, his father sent him to Europe. And that's where he really learned his clinical medicine. He worked with Pasteur, became um, just enamored by this idea of bacteriology, 
learned how to use a microscope. In his first talk uh, to the Medical Society of North Carolina, he used the microscope to show how you could see a spirochete syphilis under the microscope. Um, he, like Cobble though, became a real ardent supporter of the eugenics ideology. Like Cobble, he also became president of the university. The chair of the faculty was the equivalent at that time. Um, and when he was um, chair of the faculty, he did publish three addresses, which we'll get to. He also built UVA Hospital, which was opened in 1901. Medical education in the country, this country, was undergoing a revolution. You had basic science, you had clinical instruction, so those institutions that were going to lead the nation in the production of physicians were going to have hospitals where they could provide clinical instruction to the medical students. So Behringer is positioning UVA to be at the front of the pack with this basic science and now this new hospital. <clears throat> they start accepting blocks shortly after the hospital opens. And from the beginning, they segregate them in basement wards. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, let's see. Okay. So when he's president, when he was chair of the faculty, he uh, wrote three addresses: uh, the American Negro is past and future, the sacrifice of the race, and the Negro education in the South. And this really positioned Beringer as the leading spokesperson in the South on the Negro problem. So if I'm going to ask you, what's the Negro problem in 1900, what are you going to tell me? Everyone was talking about the Negro problem. Whether you're in the North, most people in the North talked about the immigrant problem. Most people in the South talked about the Negro problem. What was the Negro problem? who are leading plantations. They're, uns they're skilled. Many are not literate. So they're going to cities in search of jobs, in search of food, in search of employment. Some are. They are going to Friedman schools, learning how to read the Bible and becoming literate. Um, we have a very fluid society. 1870s, 80s, 90s, where there's a lot of mixed race, miscegenation, and other normal interactions between human beings. So when blacks go into cities, Charleston, Nashville, Charlottesville, do they get access to the best land? Do they get large flowing fields to spread out and homestead on? <coughs> no, they get ghettoized. And they get sent to the swamps. They go to the low-lying areas. They get pushed. They get shoved. They get the worst of the worst. And so, not surprisingly, because of less nutrition and worse jobs, they get put in tobacco factories, textile mills that are hot, sweaty, tuberculosis is happening, they're coughing, they're spitting. This is the era of chewing tobacco, so you don't go down the street or take a step without spitting out your cut. All right. So the idea is that when African Americans are moving into concentrated spaces, they're moving into spaces that are cold and difficult. In the same environment, they're not being trained and given jobs where they are able to purchase homes and spread out and have access to clean water, good housing, and stable positions. Okay. In fact, the health of African Americans who stay on the land is better in many situations than the African Americans living in cities in the South. So the Negro problem is that African Americans at the margins are fighting for food, 
they're surviving on nothing, they're getting sick and dying. You know, one out of every two, every three child is dying in childbirth. So you not only have illness, but you have poverty, and you have crime, and you have a lot of social disruption. That becomes the Negro problem. At the same time, you have African Americans who are rising, who are emerging, who are assuming power, who are being successful, who are taking, who are being elected to state government, to federal positions. And so you have individuals who are becoming very successful. You have the emergence, like in Durham, of what we call the Black Wall Street, with black banks, black churches, black colleges, black schools. So on the one hand, people are saying the Negro problem are, is the success. <coughs> At the same time, they're saying the Negro problem is this disease, poverty, and these individuals that need so much help and support. Okay. So he believes, like Cobble, in rigid hereditary determinism. And he firmly believes that biologically there is a limit to what African Americans can achieve. And like his successor, and like we've heard before, he says with emancipation came reversion to savage status, creating a new degenerate black generation that could not possibly survive in contact with white society. So you're hearing messages of Kabul, you're hearing some Jeffersonian ideas, you're hearing it all wrapped up into rhetoric. Okay. But since he is a public health person like his protege, like his mentor, um, he marshals reams of statistics. And he believes that the greatest public health threat to the white race are the six sick black people. Because remember, at this period of American history, we have no treatment for infectious diseases. So he would argue that because of the statistics he's looking at, and these high death rates of blacks and these low death rates of whites, that blacks are genetically, biologically unfit. Not only do they inherit disease tendency, but if they get sick, they have no capacity to fight it off. He looked at the statistics and he says, gee, whites are strong and healthy and robust, and from the prototypical American stock, Plymouth and Jamestown, Aha, you know, this is supporting the eugenic ideas. What's the intervention? We need to segregate, keep the whites away from the blacks. Political enfranchise them, that's going to take care of that Negro problem with these people who are successful. Transfer black education from black teachers to white teachers, and we know that, in fact, the Jefferson School and other things that we study, that it's the black teachers that are lifting up those black students. Um, and limit training in African Americans to law abiding laborers and artisans. And that's what we should do to solve and address the Negro problem. The problem is that he sends this paper everywhere and it's an immediate success. And he's, including the rector of UVA, says this is brilliant. Um, I'm so glad you're from UVA. And this becomes really the defining statement coming out of the university. He's serving as chair of the faculty. Um, and along the lines that you can only train African Americans to be law-abiding artisans and laborers, he also writes that every Negro doctor, lawyer, teacher, or other leader in excess of the immediate needs of his own people is an antisocial product of social menace. So if I'm studying African American health professionals and I'm looking at Norfolk with its black hospital and Richmond with its two black hospitals and DC with Howard and Nashville with Meharry, I'm seeing African Americans creating a separate system in the midst of incredible social oppression, created by eugenic rhetoric. That is part of the public discourse because it's part of the eugenics metaphor. Okay. So does Berger leave? He doesn't stay as long as Cobble, but he really doesn't leave. Um, he is not selected as UVA's first official president. Edwin Alderman comes in in that role. He then goes to Virginia Polytech Institute, where he serves as president for seven years. 
comes back, retires to Charlottesville, and stays here. I think he dies in 1934, 1944. And basically, he continues to mentor faculty, mentor students, and he continues to advocate for eugenics laws. And this is part of that negative eugenic policy of segregation, restriction, disfranchisement. And so he concentrates his retirement years in promulgating eugenics ideology into the citizen leaders and what they do in terms of shaping the laws of the Commonwealth and the country. Um, Edwin Alderman um, came to us from UVA, I mean, came to us from UNC. Um, he really was considered an excellent president at University of North Carolina. He stays for a long time in this role, 27 years. Um, and he decides that his purpose as president is to modernize the university through building its research foundation. The problem is he chooses eugenics as that research paradigm. It's important to understand that UVA, in production of citizen leaders, really was producing citizen leaders because only 1% of the American with col had college degrees. So to have a college degree automatically opened up positions of influence simply because you had completed that process and been socialized with other similar individuals. Like UVA, other colleges embraced eugenics, and between 1914 and 28, the number of colleges that's teaching this material substantially increases. So Heck, William Henry Heck, is one of um, Alderman's first recruits. He is brought into the education department. He is the first one to teach a formal course on eugenics. These individuals learn this material by going to what's called the Summer Institutes of Woods Hall and Cold Spring Harbor. Cold Spring Harbor still exists. It's where all the geneticists go every summer. It still is a major training ground. Um, and so he learned his material uh, in one of these Summer Institutes, comes to UVA. But he believes that his role is not just to teach the students, is to take this information throughout the Commonwealth in what became certain courses. And so he takes this material on the road and helps promote these ideas um, to high school and college faculty. Um, one of uh, Alderman's major recruits is an individual named Ivy Foreman. Um, and Gregory Dora Paul Lombardo write a really brilliant paper on him which is the way I got into Gregory Dorr's um, material. I found this paper first. He was born in North Carolina. Um, his parents were part of the Red Coats. They were involved in implementing the white supremacy government um, in North Carolina. He himself has a very distinguished academic background, got his PhD at Johns Hopkins. Um, had a major chair in Italy, um, served as chair of the department in another Virginia college before he was brought uh, to UVA in 1915. And like Cobble and like others, he cast a long shadow, being on faculty for almost 40 years. And as you can see, he rose within the administration, and in those roles, denied women admission, Black's admission, <laughs> you know, took these ideas into university policy. He writes that God allowed humans to discover natural laws in order to prove their condition on earth. Hereditary determinism, a natural law created by God and discovered by science, could be controlled by men through eugenics. And a eugenically improved population would be better equipped to receive moral instruction for there would be no more moral delinquents. Um, and he is absolutely linked to national and state eugenics groups. He collaborates 
these eugenics national leaders invite him to give talks if they're busy. They send him slide sets. He invites them to come down for university events. And he does work with them collaboratively, and if they find an idea that they don't have the staff to do, they farm it out to other graduate students at other Virginia colleges. So he promulgates his ideas not only among his own students and staff, but with other students and graduate students throughout the Commonwealth. And as you can see, his impact, he has a required biology class, which is eugenics material. Um, and it's required of all the majors. People who go into medicine and the health professions take his biology course. You know, in the old days, we all had to take biology and graduate biology. Um, and the important thing is to understand that these individuals actually uh, take this rhetoric into their term papers. You can go into his files in the library, and you will be stunned by what these students are writing in their essays. And a lot of that Greg has captured in the articles. So Holderman was a progressive educator. He comes down as one of the best um, during his era. And he really believed that University of Virginia had a responsibility to train the expert. And there was no more important expert than the physician. And so in fact, he invests in the hospital in terms of improving it. And the first writings we have of the black wards at UVA are 1916. And at that time, they're already described as horrific. So wards don't close until the late 1950s. So uh, Harvey Jordan is another one of Alderman's major recruits. Um, he is born to a Pennsylvania farmer, comes to UVA with a very impressive academic record, PhD from Princeton embryology, histology, like three different, four different areas. Um, he also does these Woods Hole, Cold Spring Harbor Summer Institutes, in fact, helps direct them. And over his course of his career, he actually publishes 177 articles and three books. But the important thing to note is that his books contain eugenics material, and every edition has the same material. Even though you're updating it, his chapters on eugenics <laughs> Don't change. OK. He also, like Lewis and Cobble and Berenger, rises in administrative authority. And as dean of the medical school, now has influence on admission policies. No surprise, we don't have women or blacks. Um, so he collaborates. There's a lot of material on his different kinds of collaborations. He's also a member of national and international societies. And as the International Congress of Eugenics in 1912, he actually says, the future medical curriculum must include a course in sound eugenics. So I think that's a research study. We need to go to all the curriculum medical schools in this era and see how many have courses on eugenics. But the important thing is that he consumes a huge amount of curriculum time. About a fifth of the curriculum time, he teaches with Bean. And Bean is another leading eugenicist. And I often, Joel will know this too, you know, when I trained, books were our Bible. We slept on our books. We outlined our books. We highlighted our books. We, you know, whatever was in a book was the truth. So when you're publishing this stuff and you're promulgating these ideas, you're creating what we now call implicit bias. I mean, this was truth, scientific medical truth. Now his impact culturally, I would say, was he was part of what we call creating a culture of fear in the community. So all, so a lot of black women, the only job they could get was as a domestic servant in the house of someone who had wealth or even a modest means. And they would go into that home and even the black nurses would often do a lot of domestic service. And African Americans as domestic people would raise children, they would cook meals, they would clean linens, they would do everything that they were being asked to do. But because syphilis didn't have a curative treatment, 
Jordan believed that individuals both inherited a proclivity to get syphilis, they didn't understand that it could be passed in the vaginal canal at birth, so he believed that it both was inherited, and if you were African American, you also had less of an ability to fight off the disease if you got it. He didn't quite understand transmission, so what he argued is all these domestic health work that were going around the community doing service were actually, at, they were risking the host family of giving them syphilis in all of this domestic activity they were doing. So here, if you've had someone in your family for 10 years and they're really your family, and this guy who's a medical expert is out there telling you not to trust that person because they could give you an incurable disease, it was really making it even hard for those women to get the employment that was vital to helping their families eat. So his argument is that there should be compulsory registration of the ill with enforcement of eugenic legislation with marriage restriction, segregation, and sterilization of all those who were ill. And these were laws that were being proposed that Barringer, who's back now in Charlottesville, was also supporting in terms of passage. Um, you know, and the important thing to understand is that nobody was talking about the environment, cleaning up the environment. This was all hereditary determinism, which was tragic. Robert Bean is chair of anatomy by 1916, and he's trained at Hopkins um, in the Hopkins tradition. He studies under Franklin Mall, who's really considered one of the preeminent uh, anatomists. And his life mission is to do comparative anatomy and prove the inferiority of black. So he takes 152 brains, black and white, and obviously measures and compares them. And no surprise, comes out with black brains are smaller, white brains are larger. But then he has all these emotional and physical and intellectual characteristics that he then extrapolates from his data. Well, what's important to understand is when Franklin Mall went back and repeated this study, he could find no evidence to support these conclusions. A challenge being on the production of this information, but Bean got his data published in 1919 at the same time of the race riots in Atlanta, and that became part of the public conversation. So the reason why this is important is when now we look at healthcare. He insisted that measurable differences existed, but he argued that human types that represent different degrees of susceptibility to disease may be segregated in given different treatments. So you could take this eugenic idea of facts and science and argue that if you don't have the capacity to fight off disease, why do we need to give you the right kind of treatment and put you in the best kind of place? You're going to die anyways. And so this became justification for segregation. And having been a scholar of segregation throughout the country, I can now appreciate how this is influencing what we're now calling structural racism in terms of the history of healthcare in this country. One of the other individuals that they recruit is George Ferguson into the education school who uses intelligence testing. And no surprise, tests, uses these tests with um, whites, mulattoes, who are mixed race children, <coughs> and blacks. And no surprise, has whites on the top, mulattoes in the middle, and blacks on the bottom. He doesn't match that he doesn't control for their classroom environments, but he believes that the use of intelligence testing can pave the way for truly scientific management of employees, which would give Virginia's industry a comparative edge. But he also argues that there's no reason to spend money on educational enhancement, on job training, on professional development, because there's an absolute limit to what blacks can achieve in what. And the tragedy is that these ideas were then used to shape policies throughout the Commonwealth. 
because UVA is producing citizen leaders. So what I want to leave you with, uh, what I want to, you know, this section is to get you to understand that the leadership of UVA was really creating a culture of white supremacy that was justified by the objectivity of race, science, and eugenics. And race, and you know, eugenics really doesn't get debunked until the 1930s and 40s. And when Hitler starts using it, it then becomes widely discredited. The response was restriction, as I said. The Americas took a negative approach and so we see the rise of laws to promote sterilization of the feeble-minded, of the disabled, of the poor, of African Americans. One of the major sterilization bills nationally was what came out of Charlottesville. The first state to pass sterilization laws was Indiana, 1907. California followed. There were a scattering of other states, and this bill comes out of Charlottesville and Richmond. Um, and the supporters of it are UVA folks. Um, but what's tragic is Carrie Buck was um, mentally challenged. Um, she went into foster care because her mother was put into a colony for the feeble-minded or a western state. And she went into a foster care and was raped by the boy in that family. The family didn't want to admit to that happening, so they accused her of being a wayward girl. They sent her away, and one of the justifications for sterilization is being a wayward girl. And so she was sterilized, and that bill, that the bill ultimately went to the Supreme Court and was upheld in 1927. And the response is that those states that were on the border passed similar sterilization laws because Virginia had support, the Supreme Court had supported the Virginia bill. And here you see laws that are in effect in 1935. States with pending are in black. There's only a few left that don't. And that book over there by Larson is actually really instructive because the Deep South is much more resistant to these laws because of the Catholic faith. They really believe that sterilization is incongruous with their beliefs. What's the impact? Well, the impact is over 7,000 people are sterilized in this state alone. Sterilization continues into the 1970s. This is an incomplete graph, but it shows that nationally, probably up to 70,000 people were sterilized. This book by um, Paul Lombardo is a really fascinating one, where it's a collection of essays on how various states dealt with the sterilization law. And like, uh, I want to say, Wisconsin, during the Depression, would sterilize people on the doles because they said, well, the state can't afford it. So it's a really interesting take on how states responded to this legislative um, movement. The Racial Integrity Act also comes out of Charlottesville. Um, in Richmond, um, uh, one of UVA's alumni, John Powell, uh, was a founder of the Anglo-Saxon clubs, and there was a band of white supremacist extremists who believed that white purity was at risk through miscegenation, and the only way to preserve white purity and the white race and the strength of the American Republic was to prevent any race mixing. And so this bill creates really the one drop rule and it defines what whiteness is. But it's not just the fact this bill passed, but that Walter Plucker, who's one of the individuals who was instrumental in developing this legislation, 
was director of vital statistics for the state health department <clears throat> for like 30, 40 years. And he was in charge of managing <coughs> this legislation, implementing it at the local level. He was also, he also oversaw all the midwives. And actually about 70% of the births among, actually probably 90% of the births among blacks were done by midwives. And he said, if you fill out that birth certificate incorrectly and put a light-skinned African-American as white, you'll lose your license. And he implemented this marriage restriction by forcing people to fill this out and prove that they were pure white and he would only allow pure whites to marry pure whites and everyone else could marry whoever they wanted to marry. And actually, this law stayed in place until 1967 when the Supreme Court overturned Loving versus Virginia. And at that time, there were 16 anti-miscegenation laws still on the books in various states throughout the United States. So the 1924 Act was passed. The 1927 Act was an amendment that further codified what black meant, what might white meant, which is the one drop rule, and in 1930, we no longer captured African Americans as mulattoes, octoroons, quadroons, it's just Negro, because that one drop rule then forced you to live behind the bed. So eugenics justified disfranchisement, segregation, disproportionate funding of education, health and social programs, immigration restriction. I could give you the same kind of graph for immigration restriction, which passed in 1924 at the federal level. Marriage restriction, sterilization of the mentally ill, criminals, feeble-minded, and really massive, massive resistance to the desegregation of public schools, hospitals, and other institutions. Why would you want a little black boy sitting next to a little white girl? They might become interested in each other in elementary school. So in terms of health care, I see this as a historian because I've studied really the creation of a parallel system to take care of minorities in this country. With separate nursing schools, medical schools, dental schools, hospitals, clinics, because the white race refused admission to people of color. And so in 1950, one of the leading scholars writes this, you know, why are there no Negroes in all these southern medical schools? You have all these medical schools dotted there, but not one black student. Actually, in 1948, University of Arkansas admits the first black student to his own. And I would argue that this ideology really justifies the way UVA treats African Americans. And they're put in the basement. I'm a historian of race discrimination in healthcare. There are three patterns. One was a separate ward. One was a separate hospital. And the worst was the building out back, the attic, and the basement. So what UVA implements is the worst of the worst. And these facilities don't change for 60 years. They get crowded and crowded and more crowded. They're not ventilated. There's no windows. They're next to the area where the dogs are kept. When I went to medical school, we did experimentation on dogs for a physiology lab. So all medical schools had a dog area where they took care of those animals, post-operative, pre-operative. So the dogs, don't bark, dogs bark all the time. So these patients remember that noise. They housed men, women, the mentally ill in the same space. So not only does it become more difficult to deliver humane care, but the care that's received, I would bet we'll find when we get into this, if we can ever really get into it, is probably really suboptimal. Because of the eugenic rhetoric, why should we treat them equally when they're not equals and they're not
they're not going to respond to treatments. And this is just another shot. Um, and in fact, um, in 1949, James Barksdale publishes a comparative study of contemporary white and Negro standards in health, educational welfare. He has a section on UVA Hospital. And he writes, because of present facilities for black children at Needy Breeze Hospital, many black parents are reluctant to use this facility. And adult patients on the black wards have been known to insist that they be allowed to return to their home to die, rather than suffer the inconvenience, discomfort, and exposure they may often undergo during the course of their hospitalization. He also documents um, the rates of diseases. So I've studied this in Durham. It's the same kind of statistics. Rate of blacks, rate of TB in blacks is four times that of white. Remember, there's no treatment. If there was treatment, it was surgical treatment. Blacks were never offered surgical treatment. There was only one sanatorium in Virginia. It was miles away. In 1937, they, the rate of tuberculosis in African Americans was 17 times higher. Um, death rate among blacks was greater than whites in all contagious diseases and cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, and pneumonia. That's what I extrapolated from looking at, looking at the study. And longevity or life expectancy was 10 years shorter. So his study also documents lower expenditures for health services, public health infrastructure, educational classrooms, resources, programs, wages, career opportunities, welfare. He cannot find one African American in a job position where he has a promotion potential and where he's supervising white. Tuskegee syphilis study. Um, it comes down in the health disparities literature as a really seminal event. Um, the architects were graduates of UVA. A surgeon General and two assistant surgeon generals. And you see their photographs there. So the architects and the directors of the study were UVA alumni. Um, the UVA supplied the US Public Health Service in 1923 with 16% of that workforce. So people would argue that there was a culture of eugenics in the public health service, really largely because so many UVA graduates were part of the public health service. Um, and a lot of the leadership, including the individuals I just showed you, were also well-known eugenicists who participated in the national and state organizations. Um, well, if you look at Tuskegee, there was a study in Norway done in 1910 of only white people. Eugenicists truly believe that syphilis is going to manifest itself differently among blacks because, remember, they're biologically different. And so Gregory Dora and Paul Lombardo argue, if you look at Tuskegee through the lens of eugenics, you see a perfect eugenic study. Because what they did is they identified almost 400 black men in the 1930s. They were diagnosed with syphilis, and they were followed for 40 years. The important thing is to know that in World War II, penicillin was discovered and used among the troops. And it was found to be one injection, one to, and syphilis was cured. And in fact, it's excreted in the urine. It's so powerful that people used to collect the urine and then give it to other patients because that medicine was so powerful as a therapeutic curative agent. It's called the silver bullet. But these men were never offered penicillin. They were continuing <coughs> to follow because this was an experiment and they wanted to see how this disease was manifested. So at the time the research was exposed in 1972 by a journalist, 28 had died of syphilis, 100 had died of related complications, 40 wives had become infected, and 19 children had contracted the disease of birth. And when this was finally exposed, actually people at UVA went to President Clinton. He formally apologized in a ceremony, documenting and, and revering and providing some reverence to these men. But one of the tragedies that comes down from syphilis, what, from the Tuskegee study, is the lack of respect. The lack of really seeing these individuals as decent men with integrity, with families and jobs and lives and faith and, you know, the complex people that we are, these men also shared. 
And so what that created um, within the medical community that's come down is this lack of trust. How can African Americans trust anybody who's white? Um, it's interesting, the studies now show that the youngest generation don't know about Tuskegee, but I would tell you people my generation do. So I grew up in the idea of human rights, and the World Health Organization was created right after World War II. And eugenics was clearly debunked. And one of the first things they stated in their charter in 1946 was health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. So I lived the first, as I was telling you, um, earlier, that I really framed so, what, so much of what I do with human rights because I was active in human rights for so many, many years. And so I look at health as a very complex thing. Those of us in medicine really see just the tip of the iceberg. And there's so much that influences the ability of people to live healthy and vibrant lives. And so when we think about health disparities, we have to think about how we're going to impact these various components of people's lives to enable them to live vibrant and fully. And one of the things that we know from eugenics is that this idea of racism has huge impact on health outcomes. And the new field of health disparities is really documenting how racism itself is becoming what we call a social determinant of health. So these are the variables that I talked about earlier. And I want us to think about those in the context of eugenics that we've learned about. So when you think about structural racism, I told you that it was legally permitted in this country to racially segregate individuals. In fact, most states had laws on the books that required blacks and whites to be segregated in different institutions if they were mentally ill. There was a black mental hospital, a white mental hospital. And it was not until 1966 under the Johnson administration the summer of 66, passed in 1965 and implemented in 66, that they actually forced every hospital in this country to abide by racial integration guidelines under Medicare and for the first time get rid of their racist policies. Having lectured all over the country, I will tell you many communities say it took 20, 25 years to really get this even close to right. And in Charlottesville, UVA integrated the threat of a lawsuit, and Martha Jefferson really integrated in response to these federal initiatives. Um, we talk about the so social gradient, social economic gradient. Um, this is an individual, um, Michael Marmont, um, who's a physician but a population epidemiologist who spent his life studying the health gap. And what it means is that people at the bottom of the ladder, socioeconomic ladder, have worse health outcomes than people at the top. He studied British servants, civil servants who had stable jobs, secure incomes, and those at grade 15 had the best health outcomes, grade 5 had the worst. And it doesn't matter whether your GDP is here or whether it's here, this gradient exists in every country, in every community, all around the world. And we know that when we see people at the lower socioeconomic position, they struggle. And he's documented this, and this now has become the platform for the World Health Organization's Millennium Initiatives addressing health inequity. We talk in the medical field and the health experience community about the social determinants of health. We know that the social determinants of health actually contribute to about 70 to 80 percent of disease burden in populations. So if we want to make communities and populations healthy, we have to look at the neighborhoods, we have to look at the schools, we have to look at access to health care, we have to look at economic stability. We have to put in place those programs 
that enable people to live fulfilled, stable, thriving lives. So therefore, housing projects actually become a health intervention. The WHO has found that the most important intervention to predict health as an adult is early childhood education. So, you know, we're getting a lot better at this. And this just says that health really is impacted by the social environment. It's not just our personal behaviors and our access to medical care. It's the lived environment that we share with one another. And if you're interested in a fantastic film on natural causes, I would encourage you to look at it. And this is the US. It says that people with higher income have a higher life expectancy. People with more years of schooling have a higher life expectancy. We can see here that people who have higher poverty have more days of poor and fair health. And we also can see that this is stratified by race. And this is where we combine race and income, and we can see that, as we found with the Institute of Medicine study in 2002, the number one predictor for worse outcomes when you control for education and income was being a minority and being African. And that, I would say, is a legacy of living in a racialized society that has adopted the idea of eugenics. This emphasizes environment where neighborhood, your zip code, is more important than maybe your family tree. <coughs> and that while we think segregation has ended, in fact, it really is a festering problem. And that it has impact. When you look at the loss of these black hospitals and these loss of what used to be vibrant neighborhoods living behind the veil, you have deteriorating infrastructure, loss of social networks, loss and lack of medical care resources. And the data show that three out of five African Americans and Hispanics live in a community with an illegal or abandoned toxic dump. This just says that those neighborhoods that struggle have less access to good food in grocery stores and restaurants. And that the more segregated you get, the more infant mortality you get. And this is Charlottesville and Albemarle County, where you can begin to appreciate the legacy of eugenics and racism. When our own African American population is five times higher than the national average in terms of infant mortality. And I would argue that this really is the intellectual framework for what we now call implicit bias, these ideas of subconscious messaging, when really good people don't realize this messaging is impacting the clinical decisions so we know that the research is saying that this subconscious messaging is actually creating worse outcomes. So I'll just finish up with some thoughts on restorative justice. Because I would argue that we can't get to restorative justice until we look at our policies, our infrastructure, our social structure, how we're supporting people in terms of jobs and growth and cultural values. And in fact, our goal is equity. It's not even equality. And that if we need, we're going to do restorative justice, we have to invest added resources with those individuals and populations that have been most harmed. And I love this. In restorative justice, practitioners ask what harm was done and to whom, what needs have arisen based on that harm, what obligation is it to meet those needs. And this is a lovely kind of framework that it really requires engagement, accountability, and restoration. 
the focus on acknowledging and restoring the physical, emotional, and social harm and related needs of all those affected to the degree possible. Attention is paid to follow through and satisfaction with the outcome. And so, you know, you kind of get the idea that the whole idea of health is wrapped up in the idea of restoration. And so, you know, I would say we're sort of just as in healthcare as focus on healing, not just treatment. And that it has to start with health as a human right. And it has to really be centered in community engagement. And these are just some of the things that we're trying to do. Um, but I think we need to do it with a framework that if we're going to do restorative justice in health, we really have to look at the social determinants of health. And I'm done. When you answer the questions, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Can you stay behind the mic so we can, we can all hear you? And I'll get us started with a quick observation and then a question. Um, the first observation is, I think, especially those of us in Charlottesville should remember that at the height of the, what we can look at as some of the greatest public policy successes of the eugenicists in the 1920s was the exact same moment that um, statuary is going up all yes, across the yeah. south to honor yes. the U.S. Confederacy. It's, it's the exact, all intentional. Yeah, it's the exact same moment to a of, the, of the height of the rebirth of the Klan. And I would recommend Linda Gordon's new book about the, uh, the second coming of the Klan in the 20s, um, which was here, absolutely. It wasn't as big as like places like Indiana or Oregon, but it was still pretty big. Um, so that's an observation that all of that is connected to this. The second question, um, for you, is, you mentioned this in your talk, and I know you and I have spoken before about some of the research that really needs to be done, because it's really only beginning. And, and I, I want you to speak as candidly as you are capable of speaking about this subject, but what research needs to be done about this history at the UVA hospital, and what might be in the way of successfully getting some of this research done? Uh, so first I want to share with you an article. Um, Douglas Smith, The Campaign for Racial Purity and the Erosion of Paternalism in Virginia, 1922-1930. But it's in the Journal of Southern History. But he talks about um, the architects of the Marriage Integrity Act. And he talks about the death of the Klan, and these Klansmen then go into these Anglo-Saxon clubs. And so the people who are writing this legislation, promoting it within the General Assembly, are really the most, some of the most prominent people in Virginia, in Richmond, and they're also former Klansmen, current Klansmen, Anglo-Saxon club members. So it's really this idea where the white society is being threatened by the emergence of a vibrant, black culture, and they use the Marriage Integrity Act as a way, as another form of oppression and solidification of Jim Crow. So what needs to be done? Um, I think a big piece that needs to be done is what does Paul Berenger do? Um, and um, you know, what does he do after he leaves EVA? What does he do when he comes back? Um, because I know there's a lot of property owned and bought and destruction of black neighborhoods. And I think that whole story of the destruction of black neighborhoods in Charlottesville is really part of a larger eugenic story. Um, you know, it's UVA Hospital, UVA is tough because it's a public institution. And they know that if they put stuff in writing and records, it's disclosable. So it's it's not like it is in other institutions where you've got really good archives. So it's taking a lot of work. Um, it's fortunately Dana and I who are working on it know what to look for, but it's nothing's cataloged by this subject heading. 
So you have to dig and dig and dig and dig and then might find a paragraph. You know, like I've gone through boxes trying to do the history of Hilburton funding. Hilburton was a federal program that was instrumental as a bridge between rabbit segregation and integration under Medicare. And actually, Hilburton funding is what led UVA to do the change, some of the changes it was doing. And then there, I, I think there was probably a lawsuit by the local NAACP because all these other major institutions are facing the same kinds of lawsuits. But I suspect that, so I, I'm done digging and digging in Hilburton, and I might find a paragraph here or a paragraph there. Because I know Hilburton, I know what to look for, and I know, you know, what is rich material when I find it. Um, and so part of it is it's not there. Part of it it is hidden. Part of it is not cataloged. Um, part of it is we'll probably have to go in other places and look at other archives and sit in a lot of living rooms. And hopefully the community will trust that the reason we want to do this is because it's a history that's really, really important to know to share and to understand its impact. Um, so I would say there's lots of stories. I was contacted by the chair of neurology who was giving grand rounds and he was giving grand rounds on someone who we discovered was a eugenicist. And so he emailed me and he said, I heard that you're giving some talks on this. Can we talk? Um, I was contacted by a psychology professor who got into records and he is amazed. He's very scared because what they had discovered was experimentation being done on twins where they were denied stimulation, believing that genetically, biologically, they would just thrive, and they didn't, and so they had to be institutionalized. So, so the impact of this could be really devastating. Um, but on the other hand, um, I'm I'm amazed that the commission individuals, Kirk and Lewis and others, are really committed to the truth and to going where the truth will lead us in understanding the fuller history of UVA and its relationship with the community. Because I think until we have that, the restoration and healing is going to be hard to do because we're not going in our own state. have gone to the medical education leadership and asked that this be required, and they have said no. It makes the university look very bad. I mean, it'll lower their reputation. Their history, the history of this is in none of the official um, histories of, the, of a university, because I've read them all. Eugenics is, is, if it's mentioned once, it may have happened once, but you know, of all the biographies, the Beringer, and the others involved, um, not, uh, you know, all the praise for them and the official biographies, and there are many of them. Never. <laughs> is so, there so, so I laugh. Uh, I know Vivian really well, Vivian Penn, and I, I think the world of her. Um, I, I really, really do think the world of her. Um, and she knows why Jordan Hall was renamed. <laughs> um, and in fact, I was getting ready for one of these lectures, and I went to Wikipedia to look up something about Jordan. And it says that it was renamed because of, he was a eugenicist. But the university has, didn't come clean with this. <laughs> I thought, wow, we got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you feel like in medical school training, like, you know, we, we are taught more like prostate cancer is more aggressive than black men. Like, is that because of health disparity or is it a true genetic thing? So, so, another hat I have worn yeah. is, um, teaching genetics to primary care physicians. And I was at NIH when the Human Genome Project was, well, was announced. 
the, you know, the coding of the human genome. I know Francis really well. I was, I was a leader of an organization that we created together. We both won the same Scott Terry Award. But anyways, and Francis, who ran the Human Genome Institute, launched the Human Genome Project as head of NIH. It's very clear. No biologic basis for race. We are 99.6% similar. There's more genetic variation within a group called a race than there is between races. We all have evolved from 10 or 15,000 individuals who migrate out of Africa, um, but we are all one human family. So if you, if a student, if a medical student comes to me and says, well, this person has sickle cell. It's African American has sickle cell. I said, why are you telling me they're African American? I, I, it doesn't matter to me. There's no races. There's no races. So, so I, on my class, I teach this, and I teach what is race, and whole session on what is race. Race is a social construct that has biologic impact because of racism. But it does not have biologic impact because there are racial differences. Because there are no races. And, and the young students know this. College students, most of them have heard this. But to get into the science and then to talk about eugenics in the context of that knowledge, they then see how the impact of racism has shaped their social experience. And when you get microaggressions, and you get allostatic load, and you get hormonal responses to micro and macroaggressions, you can see how racism as a social construct can have biologic impact. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that there's probably something that's happening environmentally that those individuals are experiencing more stress. Mm -hmm. And the stressful hormones are triggering the malignant growth. Like you, like the adverse childhood events. Exactly, stores. exactly, exactly. And there is, there's um, a woman who just got the UVA Alumni Award, who's a researcher at Hopkins. She's African American and does work in diabetes, and she's now finding that depression creates these adverse hormonal responses. It's actually a predictor for worse diabetes. So we see that in our population, Joe will know that, you know, you can't treat diabetes unless you get the depression under control. But now, now they're getting the hormonal, physiologic data behind what we're seeing clinically. Yeah. In my research in eugenics, uh, one of the things that I was interested in was the Ragged Mountain south of Charlottesville. And there was a study at the university done in 1912 by the Civics Club. And you know, I'm sure you have to be aware of that. I don't. Oh, you don't. Why don't you share, the, share it with the group? Well, uh, in 1912, uh, at the same time that Jordan came to the university, some members of the Civic Club there uh, did a study, and it's a, and it's a pretty extensive study in the Ragged Mountains southwest of town. And, um, and I was interested because my ancestors inhabited the Ragged Mountains, and there's a lot of uh, history and uh, uh, things that, that come out of there and are a little shady. but. Um, one of the things that they did was they, they took a population down there and they, and they studied them. And they broke them down into three groups. And it was the, the landowners, the, the, the tenants, and then the people who owned nothing. And, and one of the things that they did was it, it seemed almost as if it was a eugenic study without ever mentioning eugenics. But the conclusions uh, do uh, combine all these things like immorality, poverty, uh, bad decision making, everything in there is attributed to genetics. That yeah. they are, yeah. and it yeah. really recommends that they all be kind of sterilized and gotten rid of. But it doesn't even mention blacks. It's all about yeah. the three layers of whites. Yeah. So poor and, whites. Yeah, the poor whites right. were, and the feeble-minded were. That's why you used this the Wisconsin feeble. study. Well, the interesting thing was is that that uh, Clara Buck's mother. Emily was uh, raised 
in, uh, in the Ragged Mountains in her early life. The Dudley House, which became known in that trial, uh, Buck versus Bell, as the Dudley G, uh, what is it, the, the germplasm, the Dudley germplasm, um, that thing that's passed down that's uh, uncorrectable between generations, mm -hmm. um, that house still exists there on 29 South. And so uh, that's, that's part of what I am, I was wondering if you found a connection between that study, I mean, of course they had to be there because it's in 1912 at the time that all these eugenicists were um, starting to influence policy and stuff at the university. Yeah, this is a study that Royster, who was head of pediatrics, talked about this. I think this is an article that he wrote. That Ada Jukes was no anthropologist as a mother of criminals. From her, there were directly descended 1,200 persons. Of these, 1,000 were criminals, paupers, inebriates, insane, or on the street. And what they're basically saying is that the cost to New York State was about a million and a quarter dollars to maintain these people, and that probably would have been sold if they would have sterilized Ada Dukes. <laughs> right. And so Royster got really involved in colonies for regular girls in the adolescent youth girl population. And those adolescent girls were also at risk for being sterilized. But clearly they were being segregated out of the population so they wouldn't have sex and procreate because they had defective germplasm. And Carrie Buck ended up living and go being sent with her mom down in Lynchburg for years. Yes. Yeah, and then there was And her child did fine. Her child went to uh yeah. Venable. Yeah. He did fine. Yeah. First off, thank you so much for this. I'm quite frankly not a vote for a lot, but I, I'm going to try to just a little part of down into a question you might actually be able to answer. Uh, I kind of make it an informal uh, study of mine, I guess, to kind of keep track of what a lot of the uh, racist, white supremacists, whatever you want people who came here, people who are here, uh, and a lot, a lot, a lot of these ideas are alive and well. Oh, they're, they're, and, this is the rhetoric of white supremacy today. And not just in, you know, online communities and whatnot, but in the comments section on CBS News and on the Daily Progress, and I don't want to go down too far down that track, but I... I get the sense of, like, just from this hour or so of how widely these ideas spread, and not just from here, but, I mean, there are, I'm sure, tons and tons of sources in the North, in the Midwest. You mentioned California with, like, some of the racial purity laws or marriage laws and whatnot. Um, and so the sense I get is that there's, like, 150 years not more of these ideas being promoted and shared to the point that they are pretty deeply embedded. You know, you talk about the implicit bias and whatnot, but there's like explicit bias. Have you found anything in your research that is practical or applicable that your average person out on the street in daily life can do to push back on some of this? Because I just, I, I don't see nearly as a coherent, like, obviously they have like the tree of eugenics and like the briefs for psychology and all that stuff. Is there something comparable or something that we can start building that can push back against that and, and grow a different tree? Uh, something we can take away and practice tonight or tomorrow? Well, it goes back to the fact that we are all one human family. And I keep saying that to my students. And I keep asking them little questions. And then my other question is, why should we collect any, any data based on race? Because we're promoting race science. I've asked Francis this. Why, why do we maintain these categories? Because we know that they're false. And the argument I get back is, well, we want to monitor the progress of eliminating health disparities. I always said, why? By promoting race science. 
aren't we furthering the problem by using language that doesn't reflect reality? So I think that's the questions that we need to have. So I, when we're all one yeah. human family. We really are one human family. And I think restorative justice has to be focused on healing. Um, and how we get there is a lot of prayer. <laughs> a lot of work. institutions are not safe in hospitals. Now Hopkins delivers care within the Maryland market, which provides financial support to care regardless. And that created an ethic where the ID service was giving treatment to HIV patients long before anybody else in the rest of the country was. So people were getting off planes and coming to the war clinic because I didn't get treated, even though we had everything to treat them. Um, I would have to say that 
at UVA, I think it's a privilege to practice there because there is this belief that if you need care, you get care. So in terms of a value environment, it really does support the idea that healthcare is right. Unlike Duke and other places where you had to actually have the resources to get the care. Or otherwise you were sent to UNC or the county hospital. Um, so I think that is a big issue. I think, and that's why I highlight this community engagement, and maybe you can't see it, and maybe you pull it up correctly. Um, but I really do think that if UVA is going to do what it needs to do in terms of restorative justice, it's got to get outside of its walls. And it has to deliver care in the community. I'm medical director of our channel. I would argue that we have a health crisis because 60% of the people in that facility do not need to be there. And if UVA wants to lead in restorative justice, it will push to create those infrastructures in the community that enable people to not have to be incarcerated in mental health, drug addiction, gainful employment not just the minimum wage, but a real living wage, you know, on and on. And it will deliver health care to the Latino community, even if they're undocumented, um, and provide vaccination to the children and not have their parents be scared if they have to bring them into clinic. So it creates an environment that is fully welcoming and really inclusive. Um, Frank's behind you and is raising his hand. So uh, I, I, maybe I'm not interpreting this right, but what I'm hearing you say is it's not up to UVA to say what restorative justice would look like. It's, it's a community to say to UVA, this is what we have to have yeah. for that damage to be repaired. Okay, I just wanted to check and make sure that. Yeah, and that's what I said the other day at the Truth yes. Commission. And UVA has to say, yes, we will. Yes, we will. But, but the community me. has to say, what? But the community has to say, no, we demand. Because you are to serve us. And this needs to be a partnership. And, and I truly believe that Pam Sutton Walls understands this. When she was in graduate school to become a hospital administrator, she and her husband lived with a family who had received care in segregated war. She personally understands the impact of this kind of trauma. Um, and there are lots of people there that understand this. It's having this dialogue and this, and that's why I use that, um, this framework, which I really like. Um, engagement, accountability, and restoration. You know, all, all parties, those harmed, those who have harmed, and the community are provided opportunities to participate, shape the process, make the decisions. There are clear opportunities for dialogue. Decisions are made by consensus. So, so people are at the table. Not only what we can do, but this is what must be done. Like, if UVA was involved in the destruction of these neighborhoods, then UVA should be part of that restorative housing process. Anyways, so that's the kind of dialogue. Um, there's a black neighborhood that in the medical center basically dismantled in order to build a new hospital. Gospel Hill. Gospel Hill. And it wasn't in the 60s like Vinegar Hill, it was in the mid 80s. Yeah, and you know, Duke and I, and, you know, when I was an undergrad, I was part of NC Perk, and we fought back the university to try to assume that neighborhood. We won that battle. I loved the university, and next time I came down, there was a hotel there. But anyways, so I'm saying that Jimmy is not alone. All these institutions have been doing this. It's adjacent to a a historically black neighborhood as well as gentrifying and extremely insanely fast rate. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the census data of that of that neighborhood, it was it was hugely African American. Now it's 
you had done practically zero, uh, as, and that, that neighborhood is shaving away, and the people who live there are moving up into the county where they don't have access to public transit. People <coughs> of other neighborhoods that were heavily African American uh, are, are moving out into the county because they can't afford rent in the city. Well, it's a crisis. I mean, people are having to drive an hour to come to a job. Yeah. Virginia, it took so long to get yeah. recognized because they had trouble proving they were actually Native Americans because Virginia wouldn't recognize them beginning in the 20s. They just tried to erase them. And, and white identity became a, a huge thing in Appalachia, even though a lot of people are of, of, of mixed race descent in Appalachia. But there's a group of people known as the Melungeon, and, and you actually look at a lot of uh, surnames and a lot of Melungeon surnames exist throughout Appalachia and yet they don't even know that they quite likely come from such hierarchical, such a hierarchical family tree. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And this will be online. If you want to share it for the folks who couldn't join you tonight, thank you to Rick Sincere for videotaping yes. this. He'll put it up, and if you want to find it, you can find me on Facebook, because I'll be promoting it. 
and linking to it.